Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, so everybody is very welcome to um, this week's committee uh, of the executive uh, committee. We are going to make a start today in terms of apologies. We, George has given us an indication of an apology from uh, Christopher, which we'll record. Um, everybody else is either present in the room or George with us on uh, Starlink. <coughs> Um, of course, as ever, the meeting is being recorded and broadcast in Parliament buildings. Uh, just ask members, especially if uh, any that aren't used to the Senate chamber here, the phones definitely do interact with the microphones. So, um, especially for uh, George's purpose, if we can keep the phones, if you just keep them away from the microphones, that should be enough to stop any interference. So, in terms of the meeting agenda, item one, the apologies we've recorded. Um, item two, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of September at page five of the pack. Are members content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings from last week? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, okay, the matters arising. Um, during the Brexit evidence session that we had with junior ministers on the 24th of June, the ministers had indicated that they would be writing to the Assembly to outline the arrangements for delivering the core elements of the Common Frameworks uh, project by the end of the year and details of the expected Assembly scrutiny. Uh, I know that there's, in terms of um, in terms of Brexit, there are so many different committees and so many different strands that can be uh, a, a task to keep up. But the common frameworks include elements, for example, like uh, keep me correct here, the hazardous, no, the dangerous substances, for example, yeah. um, which will require the committee, uh, the assembly committees, to be scrutinising to make sure that, that we are totally across what's going to be happening going forward. Our job is to scrutinise that that scrutiny is taking place. And in order to do that, we need to know which frameworks are the priorities, which ones will need um, to be assessed, and which committees will be doing it. So, in other words, it's that framework of how that scrutiny is taking place. Our job in this committee is to make sure that that's happening. And in order for us to do that, we need to know which of the common frameworks, of which I understand there's excess of 30, although it was, we are told that there was 10, and in another instance that there's seven of them that are the priorities. So I think for us, maybe if the committee is content, we need to write um, to the uh, department and ask for that timetable, because we understand that the Speaker's office haven't received any information to date either, so we're just not sure if that scrutiny has taken place. So if members are content, we'll write off and ask for that detail. Yep. Okay. Then um, we move on then to item four. Uh, which is the implementation of the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, and especially Articles 2, 1, the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. In page 10 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers. Uh, representatives from the Equality Commission Human Rights Commission are in attendance today to brief members on their new oversight powers that they have received. And we've got them. Yeah, very welcome. So, uh, we get settled in. I'm taking an opportunity to welcome uh, Geraldine McGahey, who is the Chief Commissioner for the Equality Commission, and to Evelyn Collins, who is the Chief Executive of the Equality Commission, and to David Russell, the Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. You are very welcome. Uh, it's great to see you here today. Also great to be back to having presentations in person, which we can do in here as well. Uh, what I'll do is I'll ask the committee members just to briefly go around and introduce themselves, but I do think that we should know the majority anyway, so we'll start with the Deputy Chair. Yeah, I'm Doug Beadie, Ulster Unionist Party and Deputy Chair. Martine Anderson, Sinn Féin, MLA for Derry. Uh, Trevor Lund, no particular party at the moment. <laughs> Emma Sheehan, <laughs> Sinn Féin, MLA for Mid Ulster. Pat Sheehan, Sinn Féin. Trevor Farrant, DUP, Southampton. Okay, so, and of course myself as Colin McGrath, I was had coffee with him earlier. And of course, sorry, and that's you. what pointed me. <laughs> we also have uh, by Starleaf, uh, do you want it? George Robinson that's there uh, from up in his constituency, so George can be asking questions as well via the screens. 
Okay. So look, maybe you have a few opening remarks that you'd like to share with us. We'll pass to yourselves and then we'll move to some questioning after that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and good afternoon, Chairman and members. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. I know that I had a conversation with many of you back in May, albeit virtually, or I think it was actually over the telephone. So it's nice to be able to put faces to names. So we are actually delighted to be here to have this opportunity to brief you on the Article 2.1 commitment as set out in the Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol to the Withdrawal Agreement and to explain what our role is as part of the dedicated mechanism. You'll see that I'm accompanied today by the Chief Executive of the Equality Commission, Dr Evelyn Collins, and with uh, Dr David Russell, who is the Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. The Chief Commissioner, unfortunately, uh, Les Allenby, wasn't able to make it today, but I believe he sent his apologies separately. So, as I said, we're, we're very pleased to brief you jointly, as we have worked closely together over the last two years to try to secure the commitment to no diminution of rights and equality protections and the necessary arrangements to enable the oversight of the government's commitment. As you know, and as set out in the short briefing paper that we've supplied to you, Article 2.1 sets out the Government's commitment to no diminution of rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity in Northern Ireland, including in the area of protection against discrimination as a result of the withdrawal. These rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity are as set out in the specified part of the Good Friday Agreement. This is an important commitment given the concerns that exist about the potential for diminution when the UK is no longer part of the EU. Schedule 3 of the EU Withdrawal Agreement Act of 2020 gives both commissions new functions to enable both organisations to act as part of the dedicated mechanism to monitor, advise, report on and enforce the UK's adherence to this commitment. The Northern Ireland Act of 1998 has been amended accordingly and the whole thing will come into force at the end of the transition period on the 31st of December. Specifically, this will involve monitoring adherence to the commitment, reporting to the Secretary of State and the Executive Office, either on request or on our own initiative on such implementation, advising the Secretary of State and the Executive Committee of the legislative measures which ought to be taken to implement Article 2.1 as well as advising the Assembly and or each of its committees as relevant on the compatibility of any bill with Article 2.1. Promoting awareness and understanding of the commitment, commissioning or providing assistance for research, and very importantly, providing assistance to individuals with complaints of an alleged breach of the commitment, and ultimately the potential to bring judicial review proceedings in respect of any alleged breach, either in our own name or on behalf of a complainant. Additional resources have now been confirmed by government. Uh, they will cover staffing and programme costs, such as awareness raising, research and legal work, for example, which has enabled us to make a start to be ready to go live on the 31st of December. As a priority, we have commenced recruiting <coughs> staff to undertake the necessary work, getting legal advice on the scope of the commitment, undertake an engagement with key stakeholders, including assembly committees, government departments and public bodies, equality and human rights organisations, and also planning general awareness raising activities in the coming months. We will continue to work very closely with our colleagues in the Human Rights Commission on this, and also with the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission to ensure arrangements are in place to oversee and report on rights and equalities falling within the scope of the commitment, and that that have a North and all island uh, dimension. We look forward to ongoing engagement with this committee uh, on this important work, perhaps maybe through regular sessions, which um, you can consider at your leisure, as we work to ensure effective scrutiny of the government's implementation of its commitment. So I just want to thank you, Mr Chairman, on behalf of the Equality Commission for being able to say a few words. And if it's okay with you, uh, Dr David Russell will say a few. <coughs> um, and just to reiterate what Geraldine says, um, Les, the uh, Chief Commissioner, sends his apologies. It's unfortunate he wasn't able to make, make it today. Um, for, for, for over three years, we have been working together to protect and promote the framework underpinning human rights and equality in Northern Ireland, a framework that's central to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement 
um, a framework that's central to good governance, peace and stability under the devolution settlement. And our principal objective has been to ensure that following the UK's withdrawal from the EU, as much as possible of the human rights and equality framework would remain intact. Looking to the future, we were concerned in equal measure to ensure that Northern Ireland remains a progressive society and that new legal guarantees would be introduced to prevent any slide backwards after the 31st of December. The outcome of our discussions have been successful in some regards um, and disappointing for us in, in others. Committee members, I'm sure, will be fully aware that leaving the EU means that the direct jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice will, will no longer uh, apply. Um, and similarly, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union um, will, will disappear um, uh, in the majority. We have advised against both of these throughout the last three years. Since the practical removal of both would lessen the framework that has served to protect our individual rights and freedoms for so long. On the other hand, the UK Government is now committed to ensuring that rights and equality protections will continue to be upheld in Northern Ireland after the withdrawal, and it has done so in a number of specific ways that are welcomed. First, the UK Government has reaffirmed in the recently published Northern Ireland Office Explainer document a commitment to the European Convention on Human Rights which has been incorporated into domestic law pursuant to the commitment in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement to do so. Uh, secondly, it is acknowledged that in Northern Ireland, EU law, particularly on anti-discrimination, has formed an important part of the framework for delivering guarantees on human rights and equal treatment set out in the agreement. On the basis of this recognition, Article 2 of the Ireland-Northern Ireland Protocol commits the UK Government to ensuring that there will be no diminution of rights caused by our departure of the EU, and, importantly, to keeping pace with a number of key EU directives even after the transition period has ended. What this means is that after the 31st of December, we will be at a baseline below which we must not fall. <coughs> at the same time, if the EU decides to amend or replace the substantive rights contained in those key directives listed in the treaty to improve minimum levels of protection available, then the corresponding substantive rights protections in Northern Ireland will also develop in order to take account of this. In essence, uh, there is now a legal guarantee that Northern Ireland will not in the future fall behind minimum European standards in anti-discrimination law. The Northern Ireland Office has further confirmed that the new diminution commitment is binding on the UK Government and Parliament, the Northern Ireland Executive and the Assembly as a matter of international law. <coughs> to uphold this commitment, as Geraldine said, um, the Equality Commission and ourselves have under uh, Article 2 of the Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020 been mandated with a, a number of duties and powers. I'm not going to repeat them because they've been laid out already for you. Um, working in partnership, uh, we'll implement um, uh, our duties uh, uh, alongside the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, as Geraldine has said, um, as the commissions collectively are tasked with providing oversight and reporting on rights and equality issues that fall within the scope of the commitment that have an all-island dimension. We are also mandated to bring any appropriate matters to the attention of the specialised committee referred to in Article 14 of the Protocol, um, and to fulfil our new mandates, uh, confirmation of additional funding has been received from Treasury, and the focus now is very much on the practicalities delivering against the mandate, including agreeing how we will work together and to plan the work moving forward to the end of this year and then beyond that once the new duties and powers come into force. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, giving us the presentation. Um, as I say, it, it can be quite a complicated landscape in trying to sort of learn uh, how there will be certain uh, and various interactions in the period ahead is, is very useful for us. Um, maybe if I could start with a few questions. I suppose the first one, which is probably most obvious after what's happened in the last week, uh, there can be considerable concern um, that I suppose effectively the word of the British government isn't worth very much because they don't seem to stick to it. 
um, they have published their internal market uh, uh, sort of bill, and contained within that are a number of assertions that are at variance uh, for some of the protections that are already contained within documents such as the Good Friday Agreement and others. So I suppose maybe a question would be that if the withdrawal agreement suggests that the British government is steadfast in its commitment to protecting those rights, do you have any concerns based upon what we've heard over the past week um, and how that might impact the protection of rights going forward? Um, Mr Chairman, I can fully understand uh, the concerns of many in relation to the standing of uh, treaties and commitments by government. However, they have been very explicit in terms of their commitment to ensuring that there would be no diminution of rights or safeguards to the extent that uh, it is fully laid out, uh, not just within the uh, article itself, but also in the expandatory document that they have published. Uh, they have gone so far as to provide the level of resources that we have sought. They have worked very hard with us over the past two years to ensure that it was as good as we could hope for in terms of the commitments that were given. So we would have every faith that it will be maintained. However, you're looking into a crystal ball. Um, I accept that. But we will continue to act in good faith. Um, and we would encourage the government and anyone else to ensure that the rights uh, and safeguards are protected for all of our citizens. Um, the Good Friday Agreement sets out very clearly uh, the, the uh, principles of that, and we would hope to see that maintained. Uh, that's from an Equality Commission perspective. David, have you anything you would like to add from Human Rights? Um, <coughs> so an initial look at the Internal Markets Bill suggests that there's nothing in it that directly affects Article 2, so the aspect of the mandate that we have been charged with. Um, I don't want to say that definitively, but certainly on an initial analysis. However, on the general question, what I would say is um, human rights law is grounded in international standards. Um, and I don't think it's wise of any government anywhere in the world to step outside of the rule of international law. Um, so that, that would be a concern. But as Geraldine says, in terms of the actual provisions of the EU Withdrawal Act, um, as it affects the mandate that we have been given, it doesn't appear to have impacted upon it, um, and we continue to work in good faith. Uh, look, I appreciate those answers, and I think that they're 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 critical because, you know, with the Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission, and you, know, the, the people of the North should not have to consider their rights as being something that we have to. We're looking into a crystal ball. We should have definitive, clear, unequivocal guarantees about the rights of the people that live here. And, and what we're seeing over the past week is us being used as a trading post, uh, and it's our rights and our, uh, our cultures and our backgrounds that are being traded there, and, and it's totally unacceptable. And I think it's wise words, David, to say that they should not be stepping outside um, international law, even just a weeny teeny bit, which is what we were told uh, by the Secretary of State last week, that that is just unacceptable. If I could ask maybe a question about, it might be considered a bit processy, but given that you have this important role uh, going <coughs> forward, um, you, you mentioned there that there are a number of EU directives that, that we need to be adhering to. If there were changes to those EU directives going forward, and obviously you need to be consulted as part of that process, how, does that, how will that happen? How will you be made aware of any changes that are there to maybe highlight that you need to look at something to check that it is then going to be um, proofed against the, the protection of, of rights and equality? That is something that is currently under discussion and negotiation. Um, we will have to try to establish a memorandum of understanding with the EU in terms of their, their plans and proposals so that we are fully informed. Uh, the joint uh, working, our consultative working group uh, would also probably have a role in that as well. But I'm not that first in the detail of all of that yet. So perhaps Evelyn or David, if you would like to add in. Well, thank you. Um, obviously, it's important with the future facing element of the directives, which are listed in Annex 1 to the protocol, which um, govern uh, a range of equality issues, that we do have early sight of any potential changes to those. So it, it, it's a very good question. We've been raising it with the NIO and the, the, the 
understanding is that the joint consultative working group has part of its role under the protocol. Um, there is an agreement that the Union, EU and the UK shall in a timely manner exchange information about planned, ongoing and final relevant implementation measures in relation to the Union Acts listed in the, in the annexes to the protocol. So that would include the six um, directives in, in Annex 1 to the protocol. And we will work with the Joint Consultative Working Group to make sure that we are informed in a timely, timely manner and engaged fully on that. And I think actually, in addition to that, we would be very keen that the Joint Consultative Working Group also has a wider engagement in Northern Ireland with groups that may be affected by any changes to the directive so that it's not just a conversation between officials from the European Union and officials from um, the UK. Uh, would, in terms of a memorandum of understanding, which would be very useful because it, very will, it will clearly define exactly what the rules are on each side in terms of moving forward, is that something that you would like to see or is that something that you've heard is, is no, more concrete and happening? Or yeah, Mr Chairman, no, it's something that we would aspire to have. Okay. Um, it's my view that true collaborative working makes sure that everyone knows their roles and their responsibilities and someone can be held to account if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we would be working towards uh, and hope to encourage others to, to see that way forward. So that's something that we have on our radar and we'll continue to try to develop. Well, I think that might be useful and it might be something we could discuss after mm -hmm. if there's a way that we could write to somebody to suggest that that would be something that would be worth saying. Maybe just finally, in terms of the, the Article 2, you, you mentioned um, that you will work with the sector and that you will work with various groups to try and ensure that everybody is aware of what's happening. Uh, you know, there maybe still isn't um, a great understanding of what Article 2 is and its impact. Have you had any plans to do some sort of work in promoting that? And you know, I mean, whenever we look at the um, the European Convention on Human Rights, sort of nearly school children can nearly tell you exactly what they are because it's promoted and people within communities know exactly what those rights are. Have you any plans to develop sort of promotional work so that people understand what rights they have and how those protections would be in place going forward? As I said earlier, we have had confirmation now from, through from Treasury that resources are being made available to us for, for programme costs as well as staffing. We have commenced the recruitment process to have those staff in post. And one of the very early priorities will be in terms of raising awareness right across society in terms of what this actually means and means for them. There's a significant piece of work also to be done with departments and officials in terms of how they will be impacted by this as well in terms of screening, etc. So yes, we have that very much on our radar. We would hope to be in a position to commence that in advance of the 31st of December. But as I don't manage the staff in either organisation, maybe I should defer to David and Evelyn in this regard. Well, the promotional aspect is a statutory obligation. So it makes sense that it's one of the very first activities <coughs> that we'll work out together as, as we move forward, because the rights will only be real in terms of the article if people are aware of what their rights are. So you've hit the nail on the head. I think that's probably one of the most important pieces of work that we'll have to do initially. Absolutely agree. Okay, that's grand. Well, I'll pass to the Deputy Chairman, to Doug, then, for, for some questions. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Geraldine, David, um, Evelyn, thank you very much um, for coming here and, and, uh, and briefing us. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated subject, and it's very emotive now, um, I, I guess, and I, and I guess we're all on a certain heightened sense of alert to everything with this internal markets bill, which, is, which has come in. But um, uh, I, you've put me at ease to a degree uh, in saying that you're not tracking anything in regards to human rights and equality <coughs> that, that you would have a major con concern about. But just on that point, can I just ask, uh, are you tracking any complaints or substantive complaints in regards to it at the moment, uh, in regards to, to the, the Brexit? At the moment, it's, it's all very new and it hasn't uh, actually come into force yet. So we hmm. have no real anticipation as to what the type of complaints might be, uh, but we're preparing for all eventualities. We actually have con uh, commissioned a piece of legal work to try to define the scope a little bit better. Um, it is, um, it's rather daunting when you see it written down on paper, but whenever you consider that it has tentacles into other pieces of legislation as well. So that piece of uh, research <coughs> is ongoing. Um, and Evelyn, would you like to add to that? No, I, I think the important thing is that we remain vigilant 
across all aspects of rights and the UK government and the NIO in its explainer document you know, was quite clear that it doesn't anticipate diminishing any rights but we will want to be absolutely vigilant whether it's in relation to the Annex 1 Equality Directive's rights and any changes here that might even inadvertently, inadvertently um, result in a diminution or planned <coughs> diminution and indeed the broader issues raised by the, the relevant sections of the Good Friday Agreement. So as Geraldine says, it's hard to see where potential complaints might be arise, but we want to be comfort <coughs> and vigilant about all aspects of the rights that are covered. I am um, <coughs> not, not complaints for the reason that Geraldine has said. I mean, the, the powers and duties will come into force from the 1st of January, but over the last three years, we have done work, obviously, that has featured in negotiations to some extent, and there's some recurrent themes that we remain vigilant on. The aspect of how the common travel area would have worked in practice in a post-Brexit scenario was something we were very keen to work on over the last number of years. The question of citizenship rights in this place and what that means in practice has been well versed in the public domain, including legal actions taken on it. Um, and I guess moving forward, things like frontier workers, given that we share the only land border with another European Union member state, those are the sorts of things um, for a starter for 10. But we wouldn't want to preempt everything because the truth is when the door opens on the 1st of January, there could be 100 people standing outside it or, or none. Thanks, David. So, so can I just ask two questions? One is, <clears throat> one is very direct and the other one is slightly uh, hypothetical. But it's just on the direct question, and you might want to pass this, Geraldine, to, to, to Evan. Well, I've got two legal experts with yeah, me. Yeah, so well, it's, no, it's direct. And it's, it's a resource issue. I mean, you're resourced up to March 2023. Um, and I take it that's direct resourcing from the UK government? It is, yes. What does that look like at the minute? What are we talking about, funding and paper? What's that looking like? Uh, well, our uh, funding for the Equality Commission is for research work um, and for a staffing establishment of 10 to 11 people. Um, the specifics of that in terms of director, researchers, etc., Evelyn will be best pleased to answer. And I'm not sure you want that level of detail, uh, Mr Beattie, happy to provide it. But as Geraldine said, for this year it's in, a, in an amount for part of the year because the resources were only available and secured from you know, July, August time, is about 400,000 for us okay. and about 800,000 for the subsequent two years. So that allows us to recruit 10, 11 staff. We're going to have a separate dedicated mechanism unit, which will be headed by a director, equivalent of grade seven in the civil service terms. And we've recruited that and we'll be recruiting deputy principals in the next few weeks. And so in total by the end of the financial year, we hope to have um, about 10 staff in post, and they'll be divided across the main functions that are set out for us in our amended duties under the Northern Ireland Act. So promoting awareness, you know, providing advice and commissioning research and taking legal action. So those are the key areas of, of skill set we're looking for in terms um, of the staff. Um, and you're right, it's been committed up to the end of the financial year 2022-2023. We'll obviously be keeping on keeping under review the scale and nature of the work that is coming over the door and we'll be in discussions with government going forward about appropriate level of resources going forward. It could be more than what we've got for the next period um, and it, it might be less but we will be keeping that under review and being in ongoing discussions with, with government um, about that. I mean what is clear is that the Article 2.1 commitment um, and the arrangements <coughs> for the dedicated you know, is an internationally binding commitment and it will subsist beyond the current level of agreed resources, so there will have to be resources going forward too. Exactly, and I guess that, maybe that's the, the point I was getting to after that, and yeah. thank you for the, yeah. for the figures, but you know, if it's, a, if it's initially secured till 2023, I mean, I take it we have agreement that it will, because this has to continue, I mean, this can't stop, it doesn't say all of a stop, does it? So we, we have that sort of tacit agreement, this will just can't continue. <coughs> It's mm. certainly a strong understanding, whether we, we haven't got any figures for beyond that, it will be under review, but a strong understanding that the commitment persists and therefore the arrangements will need to persist in order to deliver on the, and hold the government to account. And that same yourself, David? Or? Yeah, uh, yeah, the figures are very, are very similar. Uh, they're the same uh, uh, in, in around 350,000, 400,000 this year. Um, and then subsequently the amounts that, that Evelyn had, had worked out. We're in a slightly different position um, in that we have a wider negotiation ongoing about the Commission's core budget with the Northern Ireland Office that needs to be settled before we are in a similar position with regards to being able to start recruitment for the dedicated mechanism. We're just trying to deal with that matter as well. But the funding for the dedicated mechanism is the same. 
Um, and as the committee will know, we are in the middle of the comprehensive spending review process at the minute, so there is a wider conversation going on on that. Thank you. Um, and, and, and the last one, if I can, please, to, to chair with, with your indulgence. Geraldine, you said that, that when we leave, there will, be a, there will be a base standard for the EU on, on rights, and that is where we will sit at the base standard. But if they raise that base standard, then we have to raise ours to, to, to match that. But in doing that, we will have no input as in elected representatives having an input into that raised standard. Is that, does that create an issue in regards to a human right or not? It is a democratic deficit, without a doubt, uh, in terms of Northern Ireland being able to input into that. But um, the legalities of that, I think David or Evelyn would be best placed to respond to. Um, I don't feel that it is an issue. I believe that the Good Friday Agreement is setting out uh, a standard for rights and safeguards for people of Northern Ireland. It's based on EU law, uh, and it is a commitment of the, the government to, to do that. So it's our job to make sure that that commitment is followed through. And that's really as far as we can go. We don't want to get involved in any political discussion on the rights no, no, no. or wrongs of it. So it's just if it happens, then we will have to make sure that it does follow through. Uh, David, do you want to add anything to that from a legal perspective? No, not, not an awful lot more. Um, as Geraldine said, uh, we have to keep pace in terms of the provision of the treaty for those aspects of the directives that impact upon the rights that are affecting the, the, uh, the rights set down in the Good Friday Agreement. Um, that's agreed in the treaty. Does it create a democratic deficit? Well, with no longer representation in Europe, so how those directives are forged will be forged by the remainder of the member states, um, and we will follow suit as a consequence. And that's really what the dedicated mechanism, keeping pace element, is going to be all about. But it's very specific. It's set down in the treaty. It is those six directives, and it must relate directly to the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement. Well, so, so, so here's the hypothetical piece, then, Charlene, if I can. So, what if? The expansion of the EU sees them bringing in other less developed nations, so therefore their rights have to drop. What if their rights baseline has to drop in, say, five years? What happens then? Do we drop our rights, human rights baseline, or do we stay at a higher level? I know it's hypothetical, but I don't know five years or ten years from now, but the EU is expanding. What happens if they do drop their rights baseline? Well, the rights that are currently there are the minimum standards, so there would be no potential or address of the issue within the withdrawal agreement as to uh, that kind of scenario, and we would be very reluctant to have that happen. The Good Friday Agreement is set very strongly on, on the principles of rights and uh, equality and safeguarding opportunities, so we wouldn't want to see that diminished in any shape or form. I uh, would be quite focal in that regard. Um, that would be my view. Uh, I believe the Human Rights Commission would have a similar view. I mean, what, what, what's been established here is the legal minimum baseline. If the EU, hypothetically speaking, was to regress in the future, there's absolutely no reason, legally or otherwise, why we should have to follow suit. Yeah. And one would hope that the UK would not be regressive, but would actually try to keep the standard, at least at the minimum, and if not, actually be progressive and raise the bar higher. Which there's also equally, just to turn your question on its head slightly, there's nothing to stop us moving ahead mm. and protecting rights better than what would be provided for in the EU. No. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in many ways, Northern Ireland <coughs> has already <coughs> slipped behind the rest of the UK in its protections. So, you know, we're constantly pushing to have law reform that brings us in line with the protections afforded to its citizens across the rest of the UK. So, we would not be in any way, um, I would say, participant or supportive of any form of reduction in those rights, uh, we would be very, very vocal in the opposite. Thank you for your indulgence to, to that question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and I think a recurring theme that we will probably be coming back to in various elements is that democratic deficit, that the fact that we will have to, to deal with various changes, be it the, the rights or, or other elements, but we have no direct voice and direct input, and we really do need to get to the bottom of how uh, we, can, we can achieve that and then how you can have your oversight of, of those things. 
I'm going to move on to members, and I know Martina needs to maybe leave a little early today, so we'll pass to yourself first, then, Martina, just um, for questions. Okay, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you so for, for allowing me to come in, and thank you and to Geraldine Evelyn and David for your presentation. I suppose, like um, many of us, we had hoped to be coming here under a different climate and atmosphere. And I appreciate what you're saying around acting in good faith uh, on your behalf and taking the British government at their word. I uh, have to say that the international community does not share your faith. And as we sit here today and um, a law officer in, um, in Scotland resigning, and we, we heard the comments from the, the Lord Chief Justice, um, I had hoped that I would be hearing something strong from yourselves with regards to international treaties being binned. Because whilst I want to talk to you about the non-diminution of rights, I certainly don't share uh, the view that, um, that you will continue on in good faith, given what has happened. And I, I think there's a community of people out there expecting um, some guidance uh, from, from yourselves, because whilst I'm listening, if I'm hearing you right, the NIO, uh, you have been obviously engaging with them from what you've been saying. Are you taking them at their word with regards to uh, Article 2 uh, not being impacted at all um, for, about what happened at the weekend or during the week? Because the drop in rights baseline, um, I would say, is something we need to be more important or more importantly concerned about what's going to happen in Britain with dropping the baseline that we have already. So when we're talking about non-diminution of rights, here, I'm trying to um, I'm trying to get a handle on what your views are um, going forward with your dedicated mechanism that is supposed to be established involving the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission as well. Um, if you have any concerns that even the British <coughs> government's claim that they're only breaking the law a little bit. An international binding treaty. Uh, have you have you concerns that um, this is going to be something that may impact on those rights in the Article Two that we are supposed to have at least secured, and they are only the minimum, they're only the floor upon which we have to build. So, does what happened in the last few days not? Use any concern? It does cause concern. Of course, it causes concern. Um, you don't want to see any international treaty breached by anyone anywhere across the world. Um, the detail of the, the bill, um, I certainly am not all over it. We have been uh, reviewing it, and at the moment, we uh, see little impact on the Article 2. We can only act on the basis of the information that has been given to us the commitment given to us very strongly by NIO and by government that they will be moving ahead with this commitment, that they, will, um, they do not envisage any circumstances where there would be any form of a breach. We have the fact that they have issued an explainer document to support it, and we also have the fact that they have given considerable resources to enable the work to commence. But like everything else, we will have to continue to watch um, to uh, consider all of the implications arising out of this, to look for any impact on the Article 2 commitment. <coughs> if there is, then we will, we will duly raise that matter. Um, David or Evelyn, have you anything further that you would wish to add? No, David. Oh, no, I mean, very briefly, as Geraldine says, just to reiterate, really, um, as far as we can see, the Internal Markets Bill has no impact on our mandate. But that's not to say that what is being done isn't of concern. Um, at the beginning of my presentation, it, and committee members may want to, to look at this, in, in the explainer document to uh, the Article 2 commitment, the government is very clear that the commitment is binding on the government, it's binding on parliament, it's binding on the executive, it's binding on the legislative assembly here as a matter of international law. The treaty is a matter of international law, um, and of course it's concerning when any state would step outside a binding international treaty, um, particularly given that all of our human rights laws flow from binding international human rights instruments. 
Um, well, given that it is binding, as you're saying, and the Good Friday Agreement is an international treaty that's lodged to the United Nations, and in that treaty it talks about an All-Ireland Charter of Rights. <coughs> so can I ask you about, when you talk about the British Government Explainer document, which states that they don't believe the North-South equivalents of rights and equality protection. So how can we have the protections under Article 2, that is EU rights, that would be applied in the South of Ireland as well as the North, and then we're having in the explainer the British government telling us that they do not believe. So they're already sending you a very clear signal around North-South equivalents of rights. Yeah. And uh, that not uh, that them not believing that there is equivalence of rights, and that's not what diminution means. I, pro yeah. I probably should have said in my opening remarks that the things that we didn't get, equivalency of rights, so north to south, south to north, was something that we argued strongly for. Mm -hmm. um, the government has a very clear line with regards to that. In its view, the commitment under the Good Friday Agreement required an equivalency of rights flowing from the north to the south, i.e. that the south had to bring up its baseline and that it did not travel in the other direction. And That is their stated view. It certainly is not something that we argued for. In fact, to the contrary, um, given the context, we thought equivalency across the island as a whole would, would have been a, a move of wisdom, but the government's position is as is stated. So how then will cross-border workers be affected? Um, by the withdrawal agreement and the implications, um, even though we have only a limited directive supply in, um, in the north. Because my concern, and this is, goes back to I think your response to the chair around raising awareness. Sometimes people don't know what they have until it's gone, and I think there's a lot of these rights protections, cares of disabled, those with a disability. The implications of stripping the Charter of uh, fundamental rights and it not being applicable here, what does that mean? How would that impact on rights protections, the rights of the child? You know, we know the Charter of Rights has more rights than the European Convention of Human Rights. And uh, is it directly applicable? Directly applies <coughs> directly. So um, I just think around some of this that the Brexit itself, which was a disaster, <clears throat> and the fact that we've already had the Charter of, of uh, Rights removed, we've already lost GFA, International Agreement Rights, we've already rights that were binding in the GFA that was going to be taken forward. So it's, um, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to operate, I think, for ourselves. And I had sort of expected, like many others, that there may have been a comment from yourselves about the implications of what was done to an international binding agreement, because we can't have a situation that people are more concerned about the protections of cows and sheep being uh, Im impacted with the, um, the bill last week, and the protections of people not even being referenced. And I think that is why um, a briefing like this is very important, and I think from yourselves the issue to uh, the issue of raising awareness with people outside about the implications of all of this is crucially important. Which is why we have been pushing really hard and trying to move very fast in terms of the recruitment <coughs> exercise to get that awareness programme planned and actually implemented in advance of the 31st of December. But as, as David had said, um, the Human Rights Commission did work very hard and negotiated hard in addressing the, the, the Charter of Rights. Um, and I don't know if David can add any more to that, but it's something. So that do you mean addressing it by letting people know yeah. that it's gone? And are you thinking now that people are aware out there of the implications of that being stripped away? I don't think they are that? aware. No, I don't think I don't so think either. Think people are aware of, of any of these issues. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we feel that it's really important to get this awareness raising campaign up and running very, very quickly. Um, it's not just wider public, but it's also departments within the civil service, it's all public sector organisations. We have a role in devising public policy. So I think the sooner that we can get that programme up and running, the sooner the wider public can become aware, <coughs> and the more they're going to be tuned in to looking for issues that become different 
and that's the piece of work that we need to continue with at pace. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And as I said, I think frontier workers in particular, mm. cross-border worker, working is, is an issue that's probably going to be one of the first things we'll look at. I mean, if I don't want the crystal ball too, too much, but you can imagine that people affected in those sorts of areas are, are, are probably, in many ways, the most likely to come to the two commission's doors early on. Um, Could you give an example to people, you know, for us to just say, get an understanding as to what potentially could happen? Well, and these are hypotheticals. I mean, it is, poten it is potential the government will say no, that there could be an issue around access to childcare provision. I know Les has spoken to the committee previously about, about this issue. There there's issues around health and social care, access to education. I mean, we have significant numbers of people moving across a frontier every day for all sorts of things, work as well as exercising their social and economic rights um, that wouldn't have previously been an issue. Those are the sorts of things that potentially could raise difficulties um, and will fall within the scope very much of the new mandate of the two commissions. Mm. So if people, if people have those sorts of things, that's why the promotional aspect becomes so integral as we lead up to the 1st of January. They should know that there is recourse to come to the commissions to talk through <coughs> the issues that, that they're facing. Um, and certainly our initial view of it is that the scope of the mandate would be broad enough to be able to capture those. Mm. Now, the government's position is, is, is pretty clear. It wasn't that the two things weren't hard fought for. Um, I was careful to say at the start, the removal of the European Court of Justice and the removal of the, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights is removing an aspect of the overarching architecture of human rights protections that we have benefited from for a long time. That in itself is a serious concern, um, but it is absolutely clear that that was a red line in terms of Brexit. Um, that battle has been lost, and therefore the Article 2 commitment will kick in now to ensure that what government has stated, which is this, in their view, does not substantively impact on the protection of rights, um, we will have to test the battle of that come the 1st of, come the 1st of January. So in 12 weeks' time, the 30,000 people who cross the border every day to work or to study, the implications that that may have on them for maybe childcare or social mm. security benefits or whatever it is at the moment, that obviously and rightly so they take for granted, that all of that is going to change. And even though there needs to be awareness raising, I would suggest that you may reflect on even a statement to <coughs> alert people before you would even get to, to go around informing people in an in-depth way. Because um, I do think it, as the clock is ticking and it's getting louder week after week, that what is coming down the track and the disaster and the implications that it's going to have for human rights for protections, for people's lives, mm -hmm. for people cares, for instance, of someone um, that may be disabled, that they live in one part of the uh, the island and, and work or care in another, how all of that is going to impact on their everyday lives. I would say that probably um, you know, a, strong, a strong statement or an awareness raising statement even in itself, if it's not that you're getting an opportunity to go around and talk to people and to groups and organisations. But I don't think there has been, when you consider other noise that has been made by other organisations that have reacted and responded, I actually think that there's a bit of concern in relation to your own silence about this. Obviously you are concerned, so I hear them, I share them, but um, I, I would recommend you are an authority that people listen to and would then be able to perhaps try and find out some further information from you. I, I agree and I accept the points that you're making, um, but hopefully you'll realise that We've only recently got our resources confirmed to us that we're actually yeah. going to be able to carry this work forward. Um, we have started the recruitment process. Some people are in post, others hopefully will be in post within the next number of weeks. But when I say a raise, a raising awareness or a campaign to raise public awareness, that will involve a whole spectrum of activities and articles, uh, press releases. So we fully engage um, with what you're <coughs> saying we should be doing, um, and we will deliver on that well before the 31st of December to the best of our ability. Uh, we think it is something that's really important for wider society to be aware of, 
and that's what we'll endeavour to do. And we're more than happy to keep this committee engaged in the process and keep you informed of what we're doing. Particularly, Chair, we have only weeks left. Mm -hmm. So whatever about going around and engaging with the rest of society, I think in the very minimum, um, a press statement is, needs to be issued in regards to alerting people yeah. who are so caught up, and rightly so, in their lives and trying to help people, and whether, say, for instance, carers of someone who is disabled or childcare, and they are taking all of those protections that they have for granted, and to think in 12 short weeks, all of that could upend their day-to-day -day living and their lives and their families. They need to hold that now. Yeah. Well, we will. We will address that. Evelyn, I'm sure. conscious uh, the layer to the ground. You can't see. You've well, been trying it, to it jump was a, It was a brief point, really, yeah. um, uh, relating to the, the, the conversation that was going on about the impact on people's everyday lives. One of the concerns <coughs> that people with disabilities have already raised with us is the difficulties that they'll have with taking their guide dog across the border. And of course, we're the only uh, member state which, uh, sorry, we're sharing the land border um, with uh, with. Uh, with another member state and the issues, if they don't get resolved, will create real, real everyday difficulties for people who use guide dogs to travel or go to work across the, across the border. We have to be mindful of that and we've obviously raised that. But if that isn't dealt with in the trade agreement, then that will be an issue that we need to be absolutely alert to. And there's a myriad of issues like that that will come up, we think, um, as a result of leaving the EU that we hope will be addressed. Outrageous. Um, Martina, you began your remarks by referring to the current climate that we're in. Can I apologise to everybody again that our exact climate includes <laughs> yeah, the heat in this room, melting, which we have tried to control all. by getting some form of yeah. air conditioning switched on. But just to let you know, it's not yourselves. We're not putting you under extra <laughs> pressure. It's just absolutely sweltering. So you still. don't mind if I suddenly take off my coat? <laughs> Please, whatever, whatever it requires, because um, it is very warm in here. Um, Trevor, all yourself. Right. It's good to see you all here. Thank again. you. Um, most of what I wanted to ask has already been asked inevitably, but um, just for clarification, I've talked about uh, cross-border workers. I'm thinking more about cross-Europe workers here. Uh, at the moment, as I understand it, UK residents or Northern Ireland people can look for a week of work anywhere, work anywhere across Europe. But the, 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 the mood in Britain, Great Britain, seems to be to restrict the right of European people to come to Great Britain to work. If, if they go down that route, will that apply to us as well? We're, we're going to be part of Europe and Britain. So if, if the UK government brings in a restriction, I think they already have, but a further restriction on freedom the right of people to come, mm -hmm. um, and Europe retaliates, mm -hmm. would that retaliation apply to us as European citizens? I think David from the Human Rights Commission would be best placed to address <coughs> that question. Well, that will depend on what passport you have, Trevor. Mm. Mm. Whether you're exercising your rights under the Good Friday Agreement or not. Develop that for me. I might have to get another passport. Well, Ireland will remain a member of the European Union, and if you're an Irish citizen living in, in the Northern Ireland, then you will continue to exercise your EU rights. If you're a UK citizen living in Northern Ireland singularly, then you will be bound by whatever the scenario is that you've right. painted out in terms of the in terms of what's negotiated by the UK government. Right. Well, that might seem an obvious answer, but it's not the one I was expecting. Um, <laughs> we did try to alert people to the disaster mm, of this. Yeah. So, an Irish passport holder from here will, will continue to have the same rights to look for uh, employment in Europe, but a UK passport holder <coughs> in that circumstance, yeah. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, equal rights, you know, if, um, if, if the European rights and the British rights legislation starts to diverge, and I think it's almost inevitable again that it will. It may not be in very important areas, but it could actually be in an important area. Uh, who, who holds sway over Northern Ireland? Are we bound by the, the, the British changes, or are we, can, can we insist on the European changes? You talked about min, minimum European standards. So if, if the British 
reduced a standard. And again, I wouldn't be one bit surprised what this government might do. Uh, could we insist, or would we, would we have the legal right to maintain the European standard? In no circumstances, see Evelyn nodding her head. Well, where the, where the um, equal treatment provisions are set out in the annex to the protocol, there's absolutely, uh, as we've said, that's the baseline be below which, there, in an international agreement, there's agreement mm. that Northern Ireland will not fall. And in addition, there's an agreement that if there's changes to the positive in Europe, that they will also follow suit here in, in Northern Ireland. So the anticipation is that we won't fall below the rights that are currently in, in place at the end of the transition <coughs> period, whether from the Good Friday Agreement or the Annex and the Equal Treatment Directives, and that any changes in Europe upwards we would also make um, would have to be made in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think that's important. It's also important to reflect that actually, in North, Jeremy mentioned it earlier, in Northern Ireland we have at the moment less rights than exist in the rest of Great Britain. We've talked to the committee before about this, for example, um, in relation to protection against age discrimination in the provision of, of goods and services here. Now, that actually is not a matter covered by equal treatment directives at Brussels, but it, in Europe, but it is absolutely the law in both Britain and in Ireland. In fact, and we don't have age GFS protections here. So there's already not parity between Northern yeah. Ireland and um, Britain yeah. in a number of key areas. So we would like to see legislative reform going upwards mm. here in Northern Ireland anyway, irrespective of um, the, the, uh, the, these provisions, although it becomes more important because of these provisions, that there is real focus on legislative protections for equality here. So in, in simple terms for me, um, if Europe introduced improved human rights in some area, that, that would apply to us in present circumstances or in the circumstances we envisage after the 1st of January, even if the British didn't accept that, right? Correct. If it's, an artic if it's a, a right that's covered by the uh, Annex 2 or Annex 1. Yeah. Right. Last one, Chair. Uh, your, your legal powers at the moment, um, I, th I think I read something here about judicial review. Is that as far as you can take a case? or can you, what, What's the highest court that you can take a rights case to in this country? It's through uh, domestic courts and judicial review. Is that it? Well, if it's a, if it's a human rights case at the minute, <coughs> Supreme Court domestically, and then after that, an individual has recourse to the European Court of Human Rights. Yeah. That's for the purposes of the European Convention, which is an important commitment in the treaty, but separate from the new mandate. So the new mandate, we have recourse through the domestic courts um, up to the level of the Supreme Court for judicial review, but where we um, we also have recourse to referring issues to the new specialised committee mm. under Article 14 of the protocol, which is essentially the adjudicating mechanism, resolution mechanism, where there's the dispute um, with regards to aspects of EU law between the European Union and the UK after Brexit. Mm. So, if you like, there's no European Court of Justice, but there is a new specialised committee and we can refer issues on to the specialised committee. But that, that's below the Supreme Court, surely? The, the ultimate arbiter here would be the Supreme Court of the UK? In terms of domestic, but the specialised committee is if between the EU and the UK, so it's beyond the domestic realm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, are you comfortable with that? <laughs> well, as I said at the start, our position was we shouldn't leave the European Court of Justice's yes. jurisdiction and we should keep the Charter, Charter of Fundamental Rights, but Absolutely, yeah. that's no longer the case. Right, fair enough. Thanks very much, Chair. Good Thank Pat. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks to the three of you for coming in. Uh, just, just in terms of, of funding, uh, and I know you've said that there, there seems to be adequate funding there at the minute. Is, is there funding there? Currently, in the event that there is a decision taken uh, to bring forward a judicial review, <coughs> or do you have to make a separate business case for that? That would be covered within the programme costs and the actual budget that we have to cover our legal work. Okay. So that would be where we okay, start. I just, uh, I, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and uh, another issue I just wanted to raise was that, in terms of no, for want of a better term, the bona fides of the British government uh, in terms of upholding their end of, of this deal. Uh, one, one of the 
things you raised, uh, Geraldine, was the fact that they had brought forward this explainer document. But that predates their breach of international law. Is does, that not correct? It does, yes. So, so in that sense, it might not be worth the paper it's written on? As I said earlier on, um, we are not in the political arena as uh, the two commissions. And all we can do is, is work in good faith with our negotiations with the Northern Ireland office um, and the fact that we have the explainer document and we already have the budgets and we have the, the UK government's word in terms of its commitment to, to the article. Um, as others have said, we will continually um, be alert to any potential breach of that commitment and then we will start to take the appropriate response to that. But at the minute, you'll appreciate that as officials, we must take their word and the fact that we have our money in our budgets to move forward, it does show a significant commitment to actually delivering on the article. That helps address your query. Okay. Um, I, I suppose then there's the issue and there was speculation in the press across the water at the weekend, the Sunday Telegraph that uh, the British government were talking about opting out of the Human Rights Act. And, I mean, the Tories are also ideologically opposed to the, uh, the ECHR. And I know that's not part of the EU. Uh, however, um, you know, if they were to opt out of the Human Rights Act, for example, to prevent uh, asylum seekers and migrants from using the legislation to prevent deportation, and it would also protect uh, British soldiers uh, in, in war theatres abroad from uh, facing claims or prosecution. Um, and yes, the, the, the EU has, has uh, said that in order for there to be uh, law enforcement cooperation, British would have to remain signed up to ECHR and to retain the Human Rights Act. So, w would you be concerned at uh, a, a move in the direction away from withdrawal from ECHR and the Human Rights Act? And what implications would that have for what we're discussing here today? Over to me. Yeah, your human uh, rights. The, uh, <coughs> so, to, to just distinguish the two. So, the Human Rights Act gives domestic force to the European Convention in part, not in all. So, for example, the freestanding equality provision in the, in human, in the ECHR isn't given domestic force to the HRA. So, they're, one instrument is based on the other, but they're not exactly the same. Um, as far as I understand it, there is a discussion, you're right, about potentially amending the Human <coughs> Rights Act. Um, as a Human Rights Commission, we'd be deeply concerned at that, particularly on the examples that you have given. Um, this place, in particular, around Article 2, and what that might mean in terms of um, legacy and uh, the requirements under, under the Article 2 provision to ensure that um, dealing with the past is dealt with effectively. Um, that is a concern. Um, and would be deeply concerned in the Commission if there was a move in that direction. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, which is slightly different, um, and I would said in the opening remarks, in terms of the explainer document in the treaty, the government is very clear that the European Convention on Human Rights will remain intact once we have left the European Union. It's, it's there in the explainer document. It's there in terms of the treaty obligation. But also, the requirement to give the European Convention domestic force is a requirement of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, so any move by the UK government to step outside, if that were to happen, the European Convention on Human Rights wouldn't just be a concern in terms of the current context of leaving the European Union. It would be a very clear stepping outside of the provisions of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which should be deeply concerning, not just to the Human Rights Commission, but to anybody living in this place. And I, and I suppose, just finally, Chair, and, and, and this just requires a yes or no answer, there, there, there's absolutely no guarantee, given the history of this particular British government, that they are in any way going to guarantee the commitments that they have made in regard to the protection of rights here. Is that not right? 
Um, if that was to happen, um, I think both commissions would have um, an awful lot of work on its plate in terms of um, maintaining the status quo and make sure that there was no diminution of rights. We would be using our, our legal powers to seek redress. Is all that I can say at the moment, unless Evelyn or David can think of another solution. But at this moment in time, if further down the road that was to happen, then we would be implementing our powers to, to raise that issue, um, to take actions in our own name, never mind in the name of a complainant, to seek the situation to be addressed and put right. Thanks, Chair. Emma? Thank you, Chair, and thank you all uh, for your presentation and for your time here today. I know we've questioned you extensively. I have a couple of things that I want to <clears throat> ask about, but just following on from Trevor's point, um, in terms of people exercising their passport rights, for, for want of a better word, obviously um, there will be a percentage of people here that will hold both Irish and British passports, um, <coughs> people that are Irish citizens, and then we have people who identify as British and have, have British passports. Can you see a situation in which those who are British and have British passports could be at a, a lesser compared to those who hold Irish passports or have less rights? Well, during the negotiations, the way it has been put to us on a number of occasions is that there may be an inevitable asymmetry of rights. So yes. Well, that's the way it's been put. But whether there is or not in practice, I wouldn't want the second guess, because we'll not actually know, um, like Martina had raised earlier, until we see how it plays itself out in practice. I, I certainly wouldn't want to say yes or no, because it may well be the case that there isn't. But equally, it may well be the case that there's a very real risk that there will be an asymmetry of rights. Um, Trevor had raised the issue about European citizenship rights in terms of exercising free movement and working rights and what that would mean if you continue to be as an individual a European Union citizen. I mean, there's clearly going to be a difference there. Um, but what else beyond that? You know, I don't think at this stage you would want to be in the, in the game of trying to second guess what might be coming down the line. Okay. The inevitable asymmetry is, is I suppose, paints its own, its own picture. Um, in terms then of the gap in rights that, that we could end up with, and I should declare an interest here because I'm the chair of our ad hoc committee on a bill of rights, can you see um, a role for, the, for, the, for a bill of rights for the North in, in plugging some of those gaps? Or how, could, how could that happen? <laughs> Depends what's in it, the answer. Yes. Um, <clears throat> We were making an argument, and people have heard the Chief Commissioner say on it on a number of occasions before the treaty was signed, that um, in many ways the, the mandate for the Bill of Rights is the European Convention plus additional supplementary rights that reflect the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. In many ways, in the absence of a Bill of Rights, that was the job that was done by the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Mm -hmm. The Charter of Fundamental Rights is based upon the European Convention, and then it has a number of additional rights included within that. Um, so there was a strong argument to say that there was certainly a case to be made that in the absence of a Bill of Rights, retaining a, the Charter of Fundamental Rights was a close second best. And we have now lost that. Um, and in the absence of that there, there is the potential that the Bill of Rights would at the very least, as a minimum, plug that gap that has now opened up. So a Bill of Rights, if one were to be created, including the rights that are included in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, would go some way. It, it would go some way, but obviously you would expect me to say that I would prefer to see the Human Rights Commission's advice from 2008 enacted in full. Obviously, yeah. Um, in terms then, and following on from the points that Martina was making around people, and you've made reference there yourself to, to people that live on both sides of the border and cross it every day for, for work or for their social life or for school or all the different reasons <coughs> that, that people do that. Are there particular concerns that you have around cross-border workers and then people who are potentially migrants to this place who are EU citizens but don't hold either Irish or British passports? 
I mean, yes, obviously, and that's one of the areas that we'll be vigilant about. And it, it just <coughs> strikes me that we should say that there will be an independent monitoring authority um, um, in place uh, separately um, to protect citizens' rights. Um, and obviously, some of the issues we've talked about here um, around the rights of frontier workers from the end of the implementation period, you know, the rights to enter and work in the country of their employment, self-employment, um, and so on. They're covered by the citizens' rights elements of the um, agreement, and there will be a separate independent monitoring authority looking at, at uh, those rights. And one of the pieces of work we will do over the next while is to make sure that we have a good working <coughs> relationship. People will also have the no diminution rights under Article 2, but we, we, we need to establish that the the, the working methodology between us to make sure that there are no gaps, um, but there are different routes for different <coughs> depending on, on the issues that are of concern for them. Thank you. I suppose uh, just a final comment. I know like before I was born, my, my mum's from Donegal and they lived in Stravan and she was still working in Donegal. So, I mean, that's the early 90s and the stories that she's told me about crossing the border on a daily basis. And obviously at that stage, there was infrastructure there sure. and how intimidating that was as, as a young woman and for some of that time, a pregnant woman crossing the border on, on foot at the, at the bridge was, was an intimidating experience on a, on a daily basis. So we don't want to regress. And I think you've indicated that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, however, do you want to ask uh, anything? It's more an observation, I'd say. It's been useful. Um, I'm sure some members didn't get out of what they wished today, <coughs> but because a lot of it was focused on hypotheticals. Um, so I have to say, for once, I'm actually re I'm encouraged by the panel in terms of what they have to, have to say today, but um, I'm sure there's others very disappointed. George, have you anything you wish to add? I'm uh, uh, Geraldine, Evelyn, and Davis. Um, my, my point would be, you know, I've mentioned several times in relation to um, the, the the cross crossing from one set, one side of the border to the other. Say, for example, a nurse <clears throat> or a health worker who lived and worked, say, for example, in Alcagalgan. Is there a possibility now that uh, they have got a British passport, it would be advantageous for them to get an Irish passport. It's just a question that was thrown up to me and by a constituent in recent times. I just thought you're the right people who could possibly answer it. Do you want to address Answer that? the query. Um, I don't know if I have a direct answer to it, but George, one would, one would hope that come the 1st of January that there will be no impact and that regardless of what passport you hold, you'll be free to work on one side of the border and the other and travel unhindered as you have done to date. And I know that's the intention of all the parties. I don't want to speak for the two governments, but it's pretty clear that, that that's the intention. Um, if, if, it was, if it was the case that that, that that didn't come to pass, well, then I think that's something that both commissions would want to seriously consider. And if a constituent yeah. faces that issue, um, <clears throat> on the 1st of January, I would certainly point them in our direction, because that's, that's exactly mm -hmm. why we've been given this mandate. Just from the Commission's point of view, how, how do they contact them? What's the best contact? Or if, if a nurse, for example, had that query? Yeah. Uh, if any of your constituents have any queries, they can contact the yes. Equality Commission or the Human Rights Commission directly on their contact numbers or website or email. All of the details are there online. I'm uh, more than happy yes. to send details to you if that would be helpful. Yes, it probably would be. Yes, I can pass it on then to my constituents. Yeah. We'll undertake to do that for all of the uh, committee members just to pass out the, the contact details that we have. That would be very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. No problem. You're welcome. <clears throat> or, uh, of course, George, it could be DUP policy for everybody to get Irish passports, which would save any <laughs> of those problems. That would certainly alleviate any of those problems, and I'm sure Trevor would be great at That's just as hypothetical as everything else. <laughs> um, okay, look, that concludes the questions. Um, thank you very much for coming along today. I suppose um, I find it a surreal that, that we're having a presentation about rights um, and that we are talking about how we have to protect them. You know, it's, it is 2020, uh, and as been mentioned, that we are left with uncertainty, and we are talking about hypotheticals. Mm.
whenever it comes to people's rights, that's what we have to do today, is talk in hypotheticals. And it is worrying as well that you are inevitably left to look at international law and international treaties as the source of protection. And yet we can have a British government that can stand up and say, if we need to break those international laws, we will. That doesn't exa exactly inspire confidence uh, to very many people. And I hope that the Secretary of State and that the Northern Ireland Office and Boris Johnson and the British government are listening uh, and getting appraised of presentations such as yours, where the protection is an in international law that they are suggesting they might have to break. And maybe then they'll begin to understand why we are so concerned and so worried. But I want to thank you for coming along here today and giving us the presentation. It's been incredibly useful. Uh, and I'm sure that I will, in suggestions from members, that we maybe will get some more updates from you as we progress towards January and beyond. But thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, just on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for the invitation once again. And we give you a commitment. We are more than happy to come back and appraise you of what's going on. Uh, it is a moving feast, and we're working towards implementation. But more than happy to come at, at your behest to explain what we're doing. And what we'll do is we'll just take a raise for a moment or two to let you get gathered and, and, and depart there. So thank you very much. And we'll thank just you. take a moment or two. Yeah, we'll take a break for a couple of minutes. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Okay, members, we'll move on then to item five, which is the report on the informal strategic planning meeting that we had last week. The information is contained on page 27 of the meeting pack. Are members content to note the session and the decisions that were taken at it? Okay, content to note. Um, I would like to uh, refer members to page three of the table pack for a copy of the revised Brexit scrutiny schedule. Um, it has been amended following the discussions at last week's strategic planning session, and the plan will be updated and revised as we move forward. Are members content with the revised plan of our initial programme of scrutiny and the actions that need to be taken on it? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, Members, at last week's strategic planning session, um, a decision wasn't reached on the request received from Fermanagh and Oma District Council to brief the committee on Brexit issues. Um, I was going to make the suggestion that as there are a number of councils that, have, uh, that are from the border area, that maybe if we invited all of the councils, all 11 councils, if they wish to send a senior representative and a senior committee member that is dealing with Brexit, that we could arrange a, a suitable event in the Long Gallery that would be appropriately, uh, have the appropriate social distancing, etc., and allow members to circulate round to meet with each one of mm -hmm. the councils and have a conversation to get a flavour if there are issues that need to be addressed and to have some level of engagement with councils. Would members agree with that? But all the councils, not just the border ones? Yeah, all 11 councils. Happy enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, Excuse me, Chair. Oh, yes. Sorry. I'm just wondering, I was actually talking to one of the ushers there when I was out at the, uh, 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 at the toilet, um, in terms of more people being allowed into the building, and obviously we had witnesses in today, uh, uh, would we be able to hold an event like that? Um, on, on behalf, as a member of the... 
Yes, Mr. President. Yeah, and the business committee, as I said, raised the question about access to the building, and they have said that if it's in relation to the work of the assembly and it is um, appropriately risk assessed, etc., then it can take place. So that's why I was suggesting if there was two from each council, that would be 22 people plus ourselves, but in the long gallery, so appropriately spaced out. So our understanding is that we, we would be able to organise that, but we would certainly get it confirmed. So we before. can stagger times. You could have one group in, say, at 2 o'clock, the next group in at 2.45, whatever, whatever the case may be. OK, fair enough. Um, members, page 11 of the table pack is correspondence from the HIA Interim Advocates Office requesting an opportunity for the Interim Advocate to brief the committee on aspects of his work before he leaves. Um, would members be content if we just sought a written briefing for that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then we can move to item 6, which is the forward work programme, which starts at 30, page 31 of the meeting pack. Um, an oral briefing from the, on, the base, on the historical institutional base and engagement with the institutions was provisionally <coughs> scheduled for the 14th of October. Officials have advised us that they would be in a better position to brief the committee later in the autumn, as ministers want to be involved in talks with the institutions and they are drawing up plans to facilitate this. Uh, do members want to wait until later in the autumn, or should we go ahead with the general briefing on the 14th, and then, if required, we could refer back to the ministers after? I, I think we should wait, Chair. Uh, that would be my view. Okay. And I'll just take the briefing from them. Sorry, I didn't. What was, what was your view? I, I, I think we should just wait rather than. Bringing them in and then bringing them back again. Yeah, I, 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 no one chair, I, I, I have a tendency to agree. There's no point yeah. bringing them in, then go in and bring them back again. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's perfect. Grand. Um, are members content to note the rest of the forward work programme? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, item seven is correspondence. Um, there are seven items in your meeting pack, just to draw your attention to one or two. Um, I'd like to draw attention to page 37 to item 7.1. It's a response from the First and Deputy First Minister to the Committee of Finance in relation to the monitoring of departmental expenditure. Now, the Committee of Finance wrote to the First and Deputy First Minister asking them to lead by example and adhere to the Department of Finance guidelines in providing timely financial responses to this committee and in turn the Committee for Finance to allow both to carry out their financial scrutiny rules. The First and Deputy First Minister state in their response that they will endeavour, where possible, to adhere to the Department of Finance guidelines in providing timely financial responses. Are members content to note that? Yes. Yep. Item 7.3 at page 240 of the meeting pack is correspondence from the Committee for Justice providing a copy of a letter to the First and Deputy First Minister requesting an update on what discussions are taking place with regard to funding the Victims' Payment Scheme. Uh, can I suggest to the committee that we write to the First and Deputy First Minister requesting that we're copied into the response for that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Are yeah. members content to note the rest of the uh, items of correspondence? Okay. Item 8, Chairman's business, is all covered at this stage. Item 9, any other business from members? Okay, then item 10 is something we do need to discuss, which is the date, time and place of the next meeting. Uh, the next meeting is scheduled, obviously, for next Wednesday. Currently, it's scheduled for 2 o'clock in room 30. Uh, now, if we wish to use here again in the Senate chamber, then it will need to move to a 3.15 start. But obviously, we are only able to have X amount of people. I think it's six We I think five or six members in room 30 at an earlier time, with the rest coming in by Starleaf, or else it's this chamber at a quarter past three, and then we can facilitate everybody plus guests. So, um, in your hands. Yeah. Here. Turn the heat oh. down. <laughs> <laughs> now we may not want. I mean, in a couple of weeks we may want the heat on, yeah. but at the, yeah. I, I, I would prefer the later time. So. The later. Trevor? I, I'm okay with in here, but down, down the years I've always had the same problem. It's not, not that easy to hear people around this place. Mm. You know, the sound system's not brilliant. But having said that, you can always tell them to speak up. 
Doug, you're happy enough? Yeah, Chai, I, I mean, I don't really have an opinion. I mean, you know, I, I wish the other place was, was bigger to hold more people, yeah. but, you know, I think we just have to be pragmatic um, in, in regards to that. I mean, the acoustics in the other place are better than, than they are in here, without a doubt they are. Yeah. Happy enough, Trevor? Uh, happy enough, yeah. yeah. I do know, again, from the Chairman's Liaison... Out the heat been up with yeah, it was well. very warm today. Mm-hmm. You know. The Chairman's Liaison Group yesterday, I think there is a request going... There is something to do with the, the cameras. It takes three people to cover a meeting because it moves from multi-positions. If that moved to a static camera that was able to cover the room, then I think it allows them to split the staff, which means that we might be able to use the assembly chamber, which means that you could have two meetings going at the same time, but there's an internal staffing issue that needs to be sorted. But the, um, I know that Leslie, the chief executive, had given an update yesterday that they're going to go off and investigate that. So if they can sort that issue out, we may be able to actually start at 2 o'clock and, and have both places going, which may allow us to be able to, to meet a bit earlier. Um, but um, yes, George, you were happy enough? Um, yes, yes. Okay, well, then, in that case, then we can conclude the meeting. Thank you very much, and I'll see everybody next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Program signed. This is the Northern.